welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the second Sunday of Easter, which falls on April 7th, 2024. You get to read Acts 4, 32 through 35. The Psalm is 133, all of it, start to finish, no exceptions. The second reading is 1 John from the beginning, 1, 1 through 2, 2, and then John 20, 19 through 31. The Gospel of Mark has proved its usefulness for Easter, and we will now put it aside until the season after Pentecost because there's just not a lot of resurrection news in Mark's gospel. But we go back to John, and does this have a, I know there's a special Sunday for like Good Shepherd. Is this like Thomas Sunday or anything like that? Is, it's always. Does it have a name? It should, Isn't right? It always, yeah. is Thomas always the second Sunday? Always. 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 Yep, always is. And I, but I, you really do though have two resurrection appearances here, two separate resurrection appearances. And right. uh, I point that out and because it makes a difference, I think, for uh, preaching the, uh, preaching particularly Thomas's encounter with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it really helps to kind of correct some of the, negative or the the uh, approaches to Thomas of, you know, the, the doubt, don't be a doubting Thomas, which never occurs in the text. And we've talked about that before. But the you, you have the first resurrection appearance, of course, to Mary Magdalene. Then the second re- resurrection appearance is to the disciples in the in the locked uh, behind the locked doors. And then the third resurrection appearance is this is to Thomas. And then the fourth one to all of the, uh, the disciple Peter and the disciples, um, in John 21 on the shores of the sea of Galilee. And because there's something extraordinarily pastoral in this, the fact that Jesus appears to the disciples, Thomas was not there. And so Thomas comes for him. Uh, Jesus. Jesus comes for Thomas, and and what Thomas needs is what everybody else already got. Mary yes. said, "I have seen the Lord." The disciples say, "We have seen the Lord." And what Thomas needs is not proof, not uh, no, not not some sort of uh, evidence for this. He just wants to be able to say, I have seen the Lord too. And that's what Jesus gives him. That's what Jesus does. And so in the midst of these remarkable appearances, right, of the risen Lord, which in and of itself is extraordinary, you have these one-on-one encounters, these one-on-one moments between Jesus and one of his disciples where he comes to them and what and what is it that they need to recognize uh who uh, that this is truly the res- the resurrected Christ in front of them what is it and that particular rate particularization and that knowing truly knowing what they will need for that that recognizing moment i think is a, a beautifully poignant and a homiletical promise in that that Jesus will find you and give you what you need to have that same kind of recognition. I have seen the Lord. Uh, Jesus knows what you need. Jesus knows what where he needs where he needs to find you uh, to uh, to come to you and to say, "I'm here. I haven't left you. I haven't. I will not leave you orphaned." Um, the relationship that you had with me is still here, and it will continue to be. And that's the affirmation that Thomas needs. This follows along with uh, what we were talking about last week in terms of uh, a God who does not show partiality and meets us in the place, as you've just described wonderfully, where we need God most. And for us not to use this text as uh, a punch against someone who's simply saying, 
I'd like to experience God the way you experience God. It, it, John, all the way through, is telling stories of people's encounters that are similar. The woman at the well, what does she say? Not the Messiah has come, but she says, come and see. And their testimony is, we ha- first we believe because you said, but we believe now because we've encountered him. And that's what Thomas is saying here. This is, I, I love the word, Caroline, this is a pastoral moment. Jesus shows up a week later for Thomas. And Jesus will show up 2,000 years later for us. That's in the text, too. And uh, and it is really a moment of abundant grace. Uh, it's Jesus being, being grace itself, grace upon mm-hmm. grace. Uh, so you wonder what, what does grace feel like or what and what what does god's grace abundant grace mean that's what that's in part what it means right that's that's that feeling of being found and my i was reminded too of a, a something that my doctor mother galo day said about this text that uh, it's not about thomas's doubt and skepticism but about the abundant grace of jesus who meets thomas's demands or thomas's needs point for point in order to move him to that, the potential of that confession, my Lord and my God. And so it is a deeply, I think, uh, pastoral moment. And similarly, similarly, as you said, it's a different resurrection account. It's a different appearance. Um, and if you think about it, the opening appearance, where are the disciples and why are they there? They're in a locked room because they're afraid. And Jesus arrives and extends to them peace, calm in the midst of their fright. And so again, this each of these resurrection appearances are meeting people at the point of their need, the point of their faith, the point of their capacity to recognize Jesus. And uh, th- that's another approach that one could take, is Jesus is willing to come. Uh, and, and, and I think the other thing that's worth, worth noting is that they were still gathering. Uh, e- even though they were gathering in locked doors afraid, they still maintained that community. And then Thomas, who wasn't there, he, he gathers with them next time. So that time is passing, and Jesus is still reaching for those who need uh, to encounter him uh, one more time. I like how Jesus waits a week. <laughs> yeah, That's why I know what that calculus was like. Like, when am I going to go visit Thomas? Maybe three days, a month? Ah, weak. That's just enough to, just enough to make him squirm. Um, I, <laughs> I, I uh, yeah. Jesus is a giver in this scene in a many wa- in many ways in terms of giving the spirit and giving himself to Thomas. I, I might have said this in recent years, but I'm, I'm really interested in how John presents Jesus's body in this in this passage uh first to give the spirit by breathing on them that, that you know Jesus' own breath now is the breath of the spirit um in this it's part of his biology now hmm. um wow by, everybody breathes and you breathe constantly you breathe without knowing it but in his breath is where the spirit resides i know there's wordplay in that but to take that seriously that that's part of his own the way his body functions now, he almost as if he almost can't help but to breathe out the spirit wherever he is and wherever he goes, is uh, significant, right? And it's self giving. Then, uh, then he offers his body to Thomas in ways that are simultaneously intimate and gross, um, mm. Mm. right? With the right. go ahead, stick your hand in if you want. And I think I've mentioned, you know, it's interesting to see artists if they portray this publicly with everybody watching and kind of gawking 
or if this is portrayed as just a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and Thomas, but it's, you know, there's, and there's something about his body now that is obviously transformed, but obviously not fully transformed. It's not unrecognizable and it still bears wounds, but this is a body he gives to everybody. I mean, and there's echoes of John six here with the bread of life as well. And, and now, you know, it's his is a body to be handled, <laughs> to be touched, to be embraced, but also he's going to ascend. So I think about Mary back in the earlier half of chapter 20, where it's, you know, you can't cling on to me. I still have to ascend, but, but he ascends as a body and he ascends as a crucified body. And he ascends, I assume John doesn't, narrate the ascension for us, uh, but he ascends as a body that's still breathing the spirit in and out. And so just to kind of play with that for a bit, you know me, I'm not much of a mystic and nor am I like, nor is my, uh, my sacramental theology as high as some others, but, but uh, this is a passage that makes me think about a very public body of, of Jesus Christ. It's there to be poked and prodded and all of those things. And it's in that body that, and of course, that there's so many resonances, right, to, and the word became flesh and tabernacle tented among us. And, and so it, you know, the word, the word became flesh, not the word became anthropos, right, man, the word became flesh. And here we have this flesh and, and it's in that, uh, I talk about this a lot, a lot when I talk about John, that, uh, that John has had a reputation of Jesus being this sort of non-embodied presence, you know, because there's so, the high, <laughs> the so, supposed high Christology of John, mm -hmm. but but that actually reveals not a very careful reading of John because any every time you get a reminder of a claim about Jesus' full divinity, almost immediately there's a claim about Jesus' full humanity. And it's in that unbelievable, incredulous juxtaposition that Thomas says truly what the who Jesus is, my Lord and my God. And it's in that it's in the in the resurrected body that makes that possible, the resurrected flesh that makes that possible. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's seeing those two together, <laughs> right. That then, that then Thomas offers the, the confession that is really the summary of the gospel. All right. We've got a lot of other texts. We do. We do. Let's go. Acts. Um, well, uh, I, I'll follow up on, uh, what I said, uh, uh before it, uh, I think when reading Corinthians, um, uh, that this is the result of the resurrection, um, that because God can conquer death, because the empire has, uh, been emptied of its power, then we can build community that we can share, that we can, if you echo this with the Ten Commandments, this is where we believe that God will provide. So we don't have to covet. We don't have to steal. We can share. We can be concerned for our neighbor. Um, I think the word is we can love our neighbors. Uh, and, and what does it look like? It looks like not a profession, but it looks like our practices. And that's what we have in the fourth chapter. Um, they believed they were one heart. They didn't claim private ownership of any possessions they held in common. What would it mean for us to become a community, uh, a, a people that formed community that didn't covet? No one had to steal because we actually practice what we proclaimed as a loving of neighbor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is at this time of the year, this text is part of the, the answer to the question, what does the resurrection make possible? Mm -hmm. And it's also a reminder of the, the multidimensionality of salvation, that salvation is more than just saying your sins are forgiven or there's hope <laughs> for new life die. after your death. But here is, yeah. 
yeah, and here is this promise of of new life available now, uh, of a transformed life available now, and the church's witness being a lot more than just what you might call evangelism, or more than just you know telling a story, but is also enfleshed in its in its life together. It actually changes how you how what a community looks like, yes. and. And that's where I would bring in the psalm, the the particularly the first verse of the psalm, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Yes. So that's yes. I would if you were going in Acts direction, I would that's what I how how I would use the psalm this week. But that You don't want to do verses two and three of the psalm? Right. We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to talk about oil running down. Aaron's beard or anything like that? Not really. No, <laughs> no, that's okay. That's all right. Uh, but it's poetry. The, but the other thing about that is. <laughs> but the other thing about the Acts text is, I, I think, another direction or another way of articulating what we've already talked about: the implications of the resurrection on life now, and particularly community is that the community itself then embodies this this great grace right this gigantic grace it's the mega lot or meg you know now i can only think of the meg and like the you know, big shark, but <laughs> thank you for that uh, <clears throat> but the <laughs> but it's uh, you know it's it's uh, megas right it's it's this great grace and what does great grace look like? Uh, look like? It looks it looks like this this moment where um, all are sharing and no and um, no one is in need. That that's what grace is, and that the resurrection is um, this is a sign of 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 resurrection promise. And uh, and so I would do I I would. I love that great grace, uh, and you, and you want and you know you wonder okay what is what is grace how do we define grace what does grace mean uh, and and this is this is what it looks like uh, this is what this is what the resurrection makes possible don't 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 preach on the Meg although I think that's a great movie I love that movie <laughs> oh come on you put it back in my head. <laughs> I love that movie. That's great. I do anyway. too. I really the love Meg. that movie. Now I'm going to have to go watch it again. Not, but the first one is. I didn't know there was a second one. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. The Trench. The Meg 2, The Trench. Okay. Go yeah. On, anyway. Anyway. Psalm anyway. 133. I already said what I was going to say about the Psalms. Easy to sing, easy to read. Doesn't last long. But uh, yeah, some interesting poetic imagery there. Yeah. Yeah. I would use this liturgically and just get uh, get a hipster with a long beard and just pour baby oil <laughs> over that person and make that no. your your object lesson for the sermon. Okay, uh, the I'm going to go back to talking the, about uh, the Meg. The imagery. <laughs> it does. There you go. It does. And, and remember, your this commentary is expression. helps with that. But it, yeah. Yeah. How about First John? I think First John. How about First John? You get six weeks. What's that? You got six weeks. Yeah, six weeks. So that that's the first thing we should say is that you've got uh, you have six yeah six weeks in a row from and reading through this uh, letter and or not letter depending on what you think of it. But uh, regardless, yeah, six weeks. So the, it could also be a direction that a preacher decides to take in terms of uh, in terms of what the next six weeks could look like as a mini sermon series on on First John. Which is and it's a beautiful letter, and a lot of familiar language uh, that 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 we say liturgically, right? If we say we have no sin, at least in my in my denomination, that's part of our uh, the words of confession. Typically, at the beginning of the service, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, and so, uh, it there there's going to be yeah, there's going to be a lot of of familiarity around this this letter that um, that might be a, might be one direction that a preacher would want to go in terms of how is it that um how is it that our liturgical life together uh, as as easter people is shaped by um is shaped by scripture is shaped by confession and shaped by testimony of what difference jesus uh the 
the death and resurrection and life of Jesus has made on a community. And that liturgical idea also becomes the practices that uh, verse seven, uh, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with fellowship. one another. Mm -hmm. And that was what we were talking about in terms of acts. What, what, so what? And what is the so what of the resurrection? Um, you said it better than I'm trying to recover it, uh, uh, Matt. But the so what is the, the new community that is formed that is not like any of the communities that our social or cultural or governments have given us. And it, it is a community where we have fellowship with one another. That's good news. Yeah, it's a it's a good letter to settle into for Easter. Probably not a letter, probably a treatise, but whatever. Um, it is. Uh, it's really hard to outline it. Like it doesn't appear to move sequentially or kind of build from idea to idea. It really has a kind of almost circular focus, which means I think for preaching you can build ideas and re-examine ideas from week to week. You don't have to worry about kind of a larger argument unfolding, but to, you know, to emphasize the way in which this is a book that's concerned about people who doubt the incarnation and people who doubt the real embodiment of Jesus. I mean, that's one of the, one of the theological projects of the letter that it's trying to counter. And I don't know if you need to take people too deep into the, into the weeds about what that looked like in the ancient world or why that matters. But to talk about ways in which this does go back to the actual tangibility, right? The actual embodiment of, of who Jesus was and how he lived and also who he is as one who's resurrected uh, and to spend time on, again, maybe talking about what does Easter mean for how we understand human bodies and human frailty and, and human hope. And I think the opening line too would, would set a homiletical trajectory that could be, uh, I think could be really meaningful for people in, in, in diving into this letter. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands going, you know, going, going back to uh, Thomas, right. Um, concerning the word of life, this life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it. There's just so much there that invites uh, a kind of, uh, it, it, it invites this participation in, in testifying to the risen Lord. And it also invites people to, to share their own, I have seen the Lord moments going back, you know, going back to the uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, what, what have you seen? What have you touched? And maybe even going back in to the beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday, and let's, let's bring all of that forward and carry that forward and how that becomes, how, how you're really almost creating a community of proclamation. Uh, with your people that that says uh, that the that the resurrection is getting preached by you um, when you say I have seen the Lord uh, and and give witness to what to what you have seen <laughs>